The decision by the United Kingdom to move its Dragonfire laser from experimental status to operational deployment marks one of the clearest signals that the Royal Navy accepts a fundamental shift in maritime warfare. Laser weapons, once locked in laboratory environments, are becoming necessary tools for a world where drones, low-flying cruise missiles, and uncrewed surface vessels can saturate traditional ship defenses in minutes. As the Royal Navy prepares to install Dragonfire on at least four warships, the question for Australia is no longer whether this technology is interesting, but whether it will soon be essential. In an environment shaped by the rapid expansion of Chinese drone capabilities and the pressure on Australia to safeguard an enormous maritime domain, laser weapons could become the missing layer in the country's defensive architecture. Dragonfire represents a new class of directed energy technology. It is designed to generate a highly accurate beam capable of destroying or disabling small targets at tactically meaningful ranges. The United Kingdom has emphasized that each shot costs less than a single unit of traditional ammunition, a dramatic contrast to expensive surface-to-air missiles that can cost hundreds of thousands of pounds or more. Precision, instantaneous engagement, and near-zero marginal cost for each shot allow a ship armed with a laser to sustain defensive operations far longer than a vessel relying solely on missiles and close-in gun systems. In a future conflict shaped by massed attacks from the air and sea, endurance becomes a decisive advantage. The Royal Navy is not embracing laser technology out of fascination. It is responding to strategic necessity. This necessity becomes clearer when viewed through the lens of Chinese military development. The People's Liberation Army has invested heavily in uncrewed systems, including aerial drones, fast surface drones, and robotic naval vehicles capable of being deployed in swarms. These systems are cheap, expendable, and difficult to track or intercept with conventional weapons. They exploit the cost asymmetry between attack and defense, forcing opponents to use expensive munitions against very inexpensive threats. Within such a paradigm, even the most sophisticated warship can exhaust its missile inventory quickly. For Australia, whose surface fleet is comparatively small and whose geography exposes its northern approaches to increasing activity from the People's Liberation Army. Laser weapons offer an opportunity to equalize the economics of the battlefield. Integrating such systems onto Australia's Hobart-class destroyers would be technically challenging, but entirely feasible. The Hobart class uses gas turbine propulsion with power generation margins sufficient to support moderate directed energy systems, provided that cooling and power management upgrades are installed. The class already integrates advanced radar systems and a modern combat system environment, capable of linking a laser's fire control with its detection network. With the appropriate upgrades, a Hobart destroyer could combine its existing missile layers with a laser-based defense zone focused on short-range saturation threats. Such a configuration would dramatically reduce the cost of defending the ship against drone swarms or uncrewed surface vessels, freeing its missiles for the higher value targets that traditional weapons are best suited to defeat. The Hunter-class frigates, derived from the United Kingdom's Type 26 design, offer an even stronger foundation for directed energy integration. Their propulsion system includes electric drive elements that simplify the process of providing the stable power required for a high-energy laser. Because the Hunter-class is still under construction, Project planners have the option to incorporate directed energy considerations during the design stage rather than during a costly retrofit. This makes the Hunter class a natural candidate for an Anglo-Australian laser partnership 
especially under the framework of AUKUS Pillar 2, which specifically encourages cooperation on advanced technologies. If Australia chooses to align its naval modernization path with the United Kingdom's adoption of laser weapons, the Hunter class could emerge as one of the first major warships in the Southern Hemisphere to integrate this technology. Technology transfer is realistic under the AUKUS framework. Dragonfire is being jointly developed by British industry leaders, including MBDA, Leonardo, and Cinetti Q. The structure of AUKUS Pillar 2 allows for shared research, co-development, and controlled technology transfer for advanced systems. Australia could join a cooperative program to develop a localized variant of Dragonfire, integrate its own artificial intelligence and sensor developments from the MQ-28 GhostBat program, and potentially assemble components domestically. Such a partnership would strengthen Australia's industrial base while reducing long-term dependence on foreign suppliers for critical defensive systems. For the United Kingdom, cooperation opens a path for scaling production and creating export markets that can sustain the industry over decades. Despite its promise, laser technology has limitations that Australia must consider carefully. Maritime environments introduce moisture, aerosols and turbulence that can degrade a laser beam's effectiveness. Directed energy systems work best in clear atmospheric conditions and shorter engagement ranges, leaving missions against high-power missiles or long-range threats to traditional interceptors. Laser weapons also require stable and substantial electrical power. Warships with older designs or insufficient power margins may find integration difficult or prohibitively expensive. Finally, no Navy can rely solely on directed energy weapons. Lasers complement rather than replace layered defensive architectures. Australia will need to view them as an additional tool, not a singular solution. However, when placed within the strategic horizon Australia faces, the advantages outweigh the constraints. Directed energy weapons provide the endurance that small navies require to deal with prolonged periods of high operational tempo. They offset the cost imbalance created by low-cost drones and uncrewed systems. They provide a sustainable defensive layer that preserves missile inventories for moments when interceptions truly matter. And they are aligned with the broader direction of AUKUS, which seeks not only to equip Australia with nuclear-powered submarines, but also to accelerate cooperation in advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence, cyber capabilities, quantum systems, and directed energy. In long-term strategic terms, Australia will increasingly be forced to manage the intersection of geography and rising technological complexity in the region. The northern approaches, the sea lanes into the Coral Sea and the Timor Sea, and the wider Indo-Pacific all present scenarios where drone swarms or massed low-cost attacks could overwhelm traditional defenses. A Hobart-class destroyer or Hunter-class frigate equipped with a laser would be far better positioned to survive and continue operating in such an environment. And if Australia coordinates its development timeline with the United Kingdom, the two countries could collectively form the first AUKUS naval units capable of deploying laser defense as a shared operational standard. As the Royal Navy moves forward with its adoption of Dragonfire, Australia faces an opportunity to align itself with a transformative shift in maritime warfare. The experience of the United Kingdom provides a valuable model of how a technologically advanced Navy compensates for fleet strain and budget pressure through innovation. For Australia, the choice to embrace laser weapons is not only a question of modernization, but also one of strategic survival in an era defined by rapid evolution in uncrewed threats. If Australia joins the United Kingdom in integrating directed energy systems into its next generation of surface combatants,
the two nations could define the operational norms of the Indo-Pacific for decades to come, shaping a defensive architecture resilient enough to stand against the disruptive forces of the future.